money changers, those who loan out and manipulate the quantity of money, were active in medieval England. In fact, they were so active that acting together, they could manipulate the entire English economy. These were not bankers per se. The money changers generally were the goldsmiths. They were the first bankers because they started keeping other people's gold for safekeeping in their vaults. The first paper money was merely a receipt for gold left at the goldsmith. Paper money caught on because it was more convenient than carrying around a lot of heavy gold and silver coins. Eventually, goldsmiths noticed that only a small fraction of the depositors ever came in and demanded their gold at any one time. Goldsmiths started cheating on the system. They discovered that they could print more money than they had gold, and usually no one would be the wiser. Then they could loan out this extra money and collect interest on it. This was the birth of fractional reserve banking, that is, loaning out many times more money than you have assets on deposit. So, if $1,000 in gold were deposited with them, they could loan out about $10,000 in paper money and draw interest payments on it, and no one would ever discover the deception. By this means, goldsmiths gradually accumulated more and more wealth and used this wealth to accumulate more and more gold. Today, this practice of loaning out more money than there are reserves is known as fractional reserve banking. Every bank in the United States is allowed to loan out at least 10 times more money than they actually have. That's why they get rich on charging, let's say, 8% interest. It's not really 8% per year, which is their income. It's 80%. By the end of the 1600s, England was in financial ruin. Fifty years of more or less continuous wars with France and Holland had exhausted her. Frantic government officials met with the money changers to beg for the loans necessary to pursue their political purposes. The price was high. A government-sanctioned, privately-owned bank which could issue money created out of nothing. It was to be the modern world's first privately-owned central bank, the Bank of England. Although it was deceptively called the Bank of England to make the general population think it was part of the government, it was not. Like any other private corporation, the Bank of England sold shares to get started. The investors, whose names were never revealed, were supposed to put up one and a quarter million British pounds in gold coin to buy their shares in the bank. The bank was duly chartered in 1694 and started out in the business of loaning out several times the money it supposedly had in reserves, all at interest. In exchange, the new bank would loan British politicians as much of the new currency as they wanted, as long as they secured the debt by direct taxation of the British people. So, legalization of the Bank of England amounted to nothing less than legal counterfeiting of a national currency for private gain. Unfortunately, nearly every nation now has a privately controlled central bank using the Bank of England as the basic model. Such is the power of these central banks that they soon take total control over a nation's economy. It soon amounts to nothing but a plutocracy ruled by the rich. The central bank scam is really a hidden tax. The nation sells bonds to the central bank to pay for things it does not have the political will to raise taxes to pay for. But the bonds are purchased with money the central bank creates out of nothing. More money in circulation makes your money worth less. The government gets as much money as it needs, and the people pay for it in inflation. The beauty of the plan is that not one person in a thousand can figure it out because it's usually hidden behind complex-sounding economics gibberish. In 1790, less than three years after the Constitution had been signed, the money changers struck again. The newly appointed first Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, proposed a bill to the Congress calling for a new privately owned central bank. Coincidentally, that was the very year that Amschel Rothschild 
made his pronouncement from his flagship bank in Frankfurt. Let me issue and control a nation's money, and I care not who writes the laws. After a year of intense debate, in 1791, Congress passed the bill and gave it a 20-year charter. The new bank was to be called the First Bank of the United States, or BUS. The bank was given a monopoly on printing U.S. currency, even though 80% of its stock would be held by private investors. The other 20% would be purchased by the U.S. government. Like the Bank of England, the name of the Bank of the United States was deliberately chosen to hide the fact that it was privately controlled. And like the Bank of England, the names of the investors in the bank were never revealed. Many years later, it was a common saying that the Rothschilds were the power behind the old Bank of the United States. Now let's take a look at the role of the Rothschild family, the family said to be the wealthiest in the world. When Amschel Meyer Bauer inherited the business, he decided to change his name to Rothschild. Amschel soon learned that loaning money to governments and kings was more profitable than loaning to private individuals. Not only were the loans bigger, but they were secured by the nation's taxes. Mayor Rothschild had five sons. He trained them all in the skills of money creation, then sent them out to the major capitals of Europe to open branch offices of the family banking business. His first son, Amschel Mayer, stayed in Frankfurt to mine the hometown bank. His second son, Solomon, was sent to Vienna. His third son, Nathan, was clearly the most clever. He was sent to London at age 21, in 1798, a hundred years after the founding of the Bank of England. His fourth son, Carl, went to Naples, and his fifth son, Jacob, went to Paris. Rothschild soon grew unbelievably wealthy. By the mid-1800s, they dominated all European banking and were certainly the wealthiest family in the world. They financed Cecil Rhodes, making it possible for him to establish a monopoly over the diamond and gold fields of South Africa. In America, they financed the Harrimans and Railroads, the Vanderbilts and Railroads and the Press, and Carnegie in the steel industry, among many others. In fact, during World War I, J.P. Morgan was thought to be the richest man in America. But after his death, it was discovered that he was actually only a lieutenant of the Rothschilds. By 1850, James Rothschild, the heir of the French branch of the family, was said to be worth 600 million French francs, 150 million more than all the other bankers in France put together. In fact, the rest of the 19th century was known as the age of the Rothschilds. Despite this overwhelming wealth, the family has generally cultivated an aura of invisibility. Although the family controls scores of industrial, commercial, mining, and tourist corporations, only a handful bear the Rothschild name. Just one year after Waterloo and Rothschild's alleged takeover of the Bank of England, the American Congress passed a bill permitting yet another privately owned central bank. This bank was called the Second Bank of the United States. During the early 1900s, men like J.P. Morgan led the charge. One final panic would be necessary to focus the nation's attention on the supposed need for a central bank. The rationale was that only a central bank can be prevent bank failures. Morgan was clearly the most powerful banker in America and a suspected agent for the Rothschilds. Morgan had helped finance John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Empire. He had also helped finance the monopolies of Edward Harriman in railroads, of Andrew Carnegie in steel, and of others in numerous industries. But on top of that, J.P. Morgan's father, Junius Morgan, had been America's financial agent to the British. After his father's death, J.P. Morgan took on a British partner, Edward Grenfell, a longtime director of the Bank of England. By 1907, the year after Teddy Roosevelt's re-election, 
Morgan decided it was time to try for a central bank again. Using their combined financial muscle, Morgan and his friends were secretly able to crash the stock market. Thousands of small banks were vastly overextended. Some had reserves of less than 1% thanks to the fractional reserve principle. Within days, bank runs were commonplace across the nation. Now Morgan stepped into the public arena and offered to prop up the faltering American economy by supporting failing banks with money he manufactured out of nothing. It was an outrageous proposal, far worse than even fractional reserve banking, but Congress let him do it. His plan worked. Soon, the public regained confidence in money in general and quit hoarding their currency. But as a result, banking power was further consolidated into the hands of a few large banks. By 1908, the panic was over and Morgan was hailed as a hero by the president of Princeton University, a man by the name of Woodrow Wilson. The money changers had been able to create a series of booms and busts. The purpose was not only to fleece the American public of their property, but to later claim that the banking system was basically so unstable that it had to be consolidated into a central bank once again. After the crash, Teddy Roosevelt, in response to the Panic of 1907, signed into law a bill creating something called the National Monetary Commission. Of course, the commission was packed with Morgan's friends and cronies. The chairman was a man named Senator Nelson Aldrich from Rhode Island. Aldrich represented the Newport, Rhode Island homes of America's richest banking families. His daughter married John D. Rockefeller, Jr., and together they had five sons. John, Nelson, who would become vice president in 1974, Lawrence, Winthrop, and David, the head of the Council on Foreign Relations and former chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank. As soon as the National Monetary Commission was set up, Senator Aldrich immediately embarked on a two-year tour of Europe, where he consulted at length with the private central bankers in England, France, and Germany. Shortly after his return, on the evening of November 22, 1910, some of the wealthiest and most powerful men in America boarded Senator Aldrich's private rail car and in the strictest secrecy journeyed to this place, Jekyll Island, off the coast of Georgia. With the group came Paul Warburg. Warburg had been given a $500,000 per year salary to lobby for the passage of a privately owned central bank in America by the investment firm Kuhn, Loeb & Company. Warburg's partner in this firm was a man named Jacob Schiff, the grandson of the man who shared the Greenshield house with the Rothschild family in Frankfurt. Schiff, as we'll find out later, was in the process of spending $20 million to finance the overthrow of the Tsar in Russia. These three European banking families, the Rothschilds, the Warburgs, and the Schiffs, were interconnected by marriage down through the years just as their American banking counterparts, the Morgans, Rockefellers, and Aldriches were. Secrecy was so tight that all seven primary participants were cautioned to use only first names to prevent servants from learning their identities. Years later, one participant, Frank Vanderlip, president of National City Bank of New York and a representative of the Rockefeller family, confirmed the Jekyll Island trip in a February 9th, 1935 edition of the Saturday Evening Post. The participants came here to figure out how to solve their major problem, how to bring back a privately owned central bank. All the participants knew that these problems could be hammered out into a workable solution. But perhaps their biggest problem was a public relations problem, the name of the new bank. That discussion took place right here in this room one of the many conference rooms in this sprawling hotel, today known as the Jekyll Island Club Hotel. The new central bank would be very similar to the old bank of the United States. It would be given a monopoly over U.S. currency and create that money out of nothing. 
Money is the god of our time, and Rothschild is his prophet. Heinrich Heine. Although Albelin Rothschild looks like a harmless gray-haired old man, make no mistake about it. Rothschild and his ancestors have hand-picked presidents, crashed stock markets, bankrupted nations, orchestrated wars, and sponsored the mass murder and impoverishment of millions. The wealth hoarded by this one family alone could feed, clothe, and shelter every human being on earth. Money changers, those who loan out and manipulate the quantity of money, were active in medieval England. In fact, they were so active that acting together, they could manipulate the entire English economy. These were not bankers per se. The money changers generally were the goldsmiths. They Exception. By this means, goldsmiths gradually accumulated more and more wealth and used this wealth to accumulate more and more gold. Today, this practice of loaning out more money than there are reserves is known as fractional reserve banking. Every bank in the United States is allowed to loan out at least 10. They were the first bankers because they started keeping other people's gold for safekeeping in their vaults. The first paper money was merely a receipt for gold left at the goldsmith. Paper money caught on because it was more convenient than carrying around a lot of heavy gold and silver coins. Eventually, goldsmiths noticed that only a small fraction of the depositors ever came in and demanded their gold at any one time. Goldsmiths started cheating on the system. They discovered that they could print more money than they had gold, and usually no one would be the wiser. Then they could loan out this extra money and collect interest on it. This was the birth of fractional reserve banking, that is, loaning out many times more money than you have assets on deposit. So, if a thousand dollars in gold were deposited with them, they could loan out about ten thousand dollars in paper money and draw interest payments on it, and no one would ever discover the decision.